Number 5. Psalms. First Quarter, 2024. John Pauline. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're starting Lesson 5, Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land. And we're part of the quarter on the Book of Psalms. Dr. John Pauline is our moderator. Our opening prayer will be by Arthur. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to speak to you. We are also much pleased, Lord, to be gathering together as your children from different parts of the world to break down your word, um, to study together and get insights about your love, about your character. We are inviting your presence as we will be doing this discussion. Help us, Lord, to uncover all the truths that you'd love for us to know. And help us, Lord, to always remember that you have shown us everything about yourself through the life of your son, Jesus. And we're asking that you grant us all these things that we pray for in his name. We pray. Amen. Amen. So this fifth in a series on the Psalms could be titled Psalms of Lament. One of the categories that scholars use for different kinds of Psalms is Psalms of Lament are Psalms of sadness, Psalms of discouragement, sometimes Psalms of complaining. And we often might feel better if these weren't in the Bible but they are. And if God is inviting us to understand him on the basis of his word, then these are the kind of psalms that we very much need to include in our research about the character of God and what he invites us to do. Let's go to number one of the handout. And there it says the psalms were expressed in an imperfect world. It's a world of sin, evil, suffering, and death. And there are many statements of perplexity in the Psalms at the apparent absence of God in the face of a flourishing of evil. And one of the most jarring parts of this poetic book is Psalm 137. Psalm 137 and verses 1 to 4. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our harps, for there our captives asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? All right, I kind of like the way some translations have it here, a strange land. The same basic idea, foreign means different, strange, I remember growing up in New York City that I often felt like a stranger in a strange land, that the city was so different than the world of the scriptures, so different from the world of the church, the world of the church school, which I was in for much of my childhood. And so living in a strange land is, I think, the experience of a lot of God's people in the world today. In fact, I think the world is increasingly becoming stranger and at a fairly rapid pace if you're one who knows God. So I want to throw open to you, how would you answer the psalmist's question? How do you live a life of faith in a strange land? And to make it as personal as possible, how do you live a life of faith in a strange land? What is strange to you? How have you coped with it? What does it mean to have faith in a strange land? All right, Lou. That's the only way that I can live in a strange land is knowing that he's with me and all of his wonderful promises of who he is and that he will always be with me, no matter whether I go through the valley of the shadow of death or whatever becomes my experience that he promises to be with me. And, and that just gives me a lot of comfort and I don't lose hope. That gives me hope. All right. What about the rest of you? What have you found strange in today's world? How have you made your way in the midst of all that? Henry. I'm an immigrant into the United States for over 20 years. So I can tell you the experience of living in a strange land. 
with a different language, with a different culture, with a different way to be treated by others, because I don't seem to look like the majority. I can tell you a lot, multiple stories about those interactions that remind me every single day that I live in a strange land. But as Daniel Dura reminds us very frequently, we don't choose our emotions, right? They just come after the experiences, but we choose the reaction, the way that we react to them. And reality is what guides us in this journey. The reality of knowing that there is a God that chose also, like I did, to live in a strange land, knowing that there was a father, loving father, always next to him. Unfortunately, that was not the reality for me of all of my life. Sometimes I, although I never thought that God was an enemy, I thought that one day I needed to face him with all this stuff that he knew. But now I know in a different way that he always knew, but he was willing to help, not actually waiting for me to make things even. So that makes a difference. And I can live and continue to live in a strange land because I am close to the owner of all these lands. Now, I really like what you brought out of the idea that when Jesus, Jesus was in a strange land. So whenever we feel that way, we are not isolated. We're not alone in those feelings, but God understands through Jesus Christ, he himself became a stranger in a strange land. And Jesus always had the father with him. So walking, whenever things feel strange, walking in the conscious presence of God, I think is very helpful. Nancy? I feel like I'm living in a strange land in that I'm in a living situation I never planned on. I heard a saying that life is what happens while you're making other plans. And that's sort of, I'm living in a retirement community. It's independent living. But when Parkinson's disease hit our family, our lives just crumbled everywhere. Our business, our ranch, even our church membership, we can't get there very often. And we're living in a situation with lovely people, but I'm in the city. I hate living by the busiest road in Kelowna. It's the main freeway through town, but this is where we're landed. And there are things, if I look, nature still survives here and there's some birds and squirrels, but there's lots of traffic noise. And I feel like I'm in a strange situation. And I think of Daniel and Joseph, they didn't make those plans, what happened to them. And then the story of Habakkuk has helped me where he said, what's going on, Lord? You're not doing anything. And I can reflect that. And yet to hear that God says, I am doing something like Terry mentioned in the last lesson, and that that's where the text, the just shall live by faith, by trust. And that's helped me I need to just hold on. God's got his hand over this great controversy. He's got the big picture in mind. And also, I like what I learned in your lessons a few weeks ago. It's God's mission, and I need to join that. It's, it's not my plans. So I need to find out and cooperate every day with his mission. And so I think, I'm thankful for the lessons here and the people here. You're an encouragement to me. So thank you. Thank you for a very personal response. And I think that can be tremendously helpful for everyone as they reflect on their own personal situation, their own reactions, etc. Hearing it expressed so directly and so clearly, I appreciate that very much. Let's go on to number two. And here are a couple of these Psalms of lament. And let's start with Psalm 74 and verses 18 to 22. Remember this, O Lord, how the enemy scoffs and an impious people reviles your name. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild animals. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. And have regard for your covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of the haunts of violence. God and be put to shame. Let the poor and the needy praise your name. Rise up, O God, plead your cause. Remember how the impious scoff at you all day long. All right, so the psalmist here is actually concerned about the reputation of God. And this is a situation where Israel seems to be faring badly in relation to its enemies. 
and the enemies of Israel are mocking God. Every time Israel is defeated in Babylon, the enemies see it as a defeat of Israel's God. So the psalmist is saying, you know, we'd be happy if you deliver us in battle, but you might also be delivering yourself from a really bad reputation. So this is a psalm that laments the situation and calls on God for action. Move on to Psalm 79 and verses 5 through 13. Psalm 79, 5 through 13. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealous wrath burn like fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember against us the iniquities of our ancestors. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Let the avenging of outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. Let the groans of the prisoners come before you. According to your great power, preserve those doomed to die. Return sevenfold into the bosom of our neighbors, the taunts with which they taunted you, O Lord. Then we, your people, the flock of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. This is one of about 10 places in the Bible where you have this plaintive cry, how long, O Lord. Israel seems to be suffering for a considerable period of time. And in the view of the psalmist, God seems to be attacking the wrong people. Instead of delivering Israel from the enemies, he seems to be on the enemy's side. And the psalmist wonders, is it our fault? Are we to blame for your silence? The nations are mocking God, etc. At what point in Israel's history do you think this psalm was written? What period of Israel's history would seem to fit into this type of a prayer to God? Yes, Henry. It seems to me that probably during the captivity in Babylon. Yeah, well, that's, I think, a very natural place to go, that the captivity to Babylon. The challenge, though, is this is a psalm of Asaph, both of them. And Asaph is generally considered to have been like a choir director in David's court. That's not the only possible answer, but there's the question, does this fit in that context? We sometimes have the idea, because so many of the psalms were written by David, that they must all be in that period of time. And I think we did notice earlier in this series that a number of psalms seem to fit much better quite a bit later on than David's time. So this opens us up to possibilities that we might not have thought before. Henry? Yes, and I base my opinion about this being in the Babylonian captivity because uh, the psalmist addresses the fact that the holy temple was defiled, that it was reduced to rumble. So it could have not been before David because there was no temple, and it was after Solomon because during Solomon there was no destruction. So the only time that Jerusalem is destroyed, reduced to rumble, it only happened during the Babylonian captivity. So could that be that there was another Asaph that was not a David's contemporary or that was assigned wrongly by somebody that thinks that this is an Asaph from the time of David? Well, I count on Henry to always read the context, and sometimes the questions that I ask you are thought questions, but that sometimes can be answered in the context. And let's take a look at that quick. You're, you're in Psalm 79 at the moment, so Terry, would you read verse 1 of Psalm 79? Oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. All right. So I think this is what Henry was referring to, that there's a strong sense that this is a time when Jerusalem is destroyed. And within the Old Testament, that would most likely refer to the time when the Babylonians came. While we're there, go back to Psalm 74. And Terry, would you read the first eight verses? Because I think they also help to clarify this. Oh God, why do you cast us off forever? 
Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you acquired long ago, which you redeemed to be the tribe of your inheritance. Remember Mount Zion, where you came to dwell. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Your foes have roared within your holy place. They set up their emblems there. At the upper entrance, they hacked the wooden trellis with axes. And then, with hatchets and hammers, they smashed all its carved work. They set your sanctuary on fire. They desecrated the dwelling place of your name, bringing it to the ground. They said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. They burned all the meeting places of God in the land. All right. So here you see very much in a detailed description of the destruction of the sanctuary piece by piece. Bob, your thoughts on this? Well, is there anything from the Jewish historians that comment on how the Psalms were put together, because they do cover a lot of different topics. When you get into the discussion we just had, it does sound like the temple was destroyed. Yeah. But it's hard to reconcile that if that's all David, you know. Right. Well, it's interesting that a note in my Bible on Psalm 74 says, author Asaph or one of his descendants. And so I think one way to reconcile this challenge is the idea that you had a school of Asaph, a theological school or a music school, and that the psalm would have arisen out of that school rather than necessarily Asaph himself. So the Bible is a collection of a number of things that have been handed down through the centuries, and often attributions are made that may be very specific or may at times reflect attributions made later on by descendants. So anyway, we don't have to resolve the problem, but it is clear that in Israel's history, you have a particular challenge with the destruction of Jerusalem. Arthur? I'm trying to imagine how it must have felt to any one of them that witnessed the temple being bent to the ground and maybe considering what they believe the temple represented the presence of god his holiness as long as the temple was standing they had the assurance that god was amongst them but for some reason god is allowing these enemies to do all that with impunity and it's raised to the ground and now when there's no temple is there any hope when there isn't any physical representation of God's presence? And maybe the frustration is, why God are you allowing people to do this? Something that we hold so sacred and it's so important. Why are you letting them do that? It's almost like being faced with a situation that kind of makes you question the existence of God, as it were, where you reach a place where you think, if the temple is gone, is God existing? If he is still existing, why is he allowing the temple to go? I like very much, Arthur, that you're pointing us back to the original situation at this point and really getting a sense of it, a feel of it, because we have the idea of a universal Holy Spirit, that God is present in every place through the Holy Spirit and that we can encounter God everywhere. Now, the Hebrews had a similar idea, as we saw in last week's lesson, the idea that God is fully familiar with every detail of our lives. At the same time, for the Israelites, God was best encountered at the temple. So there's a combination of ideas. There's a sense that God knows everything about us, but that we encounter God at the temple, that God is localized at the temple. And so the temple was not simply a place honoring God but it was truly the place where God chose to reside. So God is universal, yes, but that he chose to reside in this place and the destruction of that temple would have been a huge scandal at the time that it happened for Israel. Michael. I have a question about the last verse of Psalms 79, which says, if you do these things, then we'll flock to you and give you praise and so forth, which would be, thanksgiving and so forth but is it conditional if you do these things we'll praise you mm -hmm. so the psalmist is saying then your people the sheep of your pastor will praise you or forever 
will recount your praise. Yeah, one way to read that is that the psalmist is simply saying that, okay, let's make a deal here. You do this and I'll do that. Okay, in other words, you could read that a psalmist is proposing a covenant to God instead of the other way around. I think the other way to read it, and maybe the more helpful way, is the idea the psalmist is simply saying, look, if you answer my prayer, your people are going to be super grateful, and they will be praising you as a result. So perhaps he is simply saying to God, here are the consequences of your actions that will result in a lot of praise, and, and that's got to be a good thing. You know? What do you think, Michael? I think the latter part of what you stated is correct. In that. Because the Israelites regarded God as everything, the creator and so forth. And first of all, they believed in a monotheistic God. There's just one God. And what I think the saying is that in thanksgiving, we will praise you, not as a condition, but and not only praise you, but continue to do so forever. All right. Henry. When I was preparing for this lesson, studying this, it seemed to me that this psalm was a kind of an arrogant psalm because it gave me the idea that it happened during the captivity. And now the Israelites, the psalmist, is pretending that they are in bad trouble just because God forsake them. But if we tie this with Isaiah 1, which is prior to the captivity, God is reaching out to them. Hey, guys, don't continue going in that direction. Even the animals know the right way and you are not choosing the right way. You are going to go into destruction. And then we find in Jeremiah saying, don't even count on these false promises of temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord, and forget that when you are going to the temple, Isaiah was saying, you are not coming to see God. You are coming with blood in your hands. They had a grown picture of God. They have multiple idols inside of that temple. So now they are trying to pretend in this psalm that we don't know why all of these bad things are happening to us. Probably something wrong on your side. Mm -hmm. And what I love in this is that God never responded to them saying, what a hypocrite you are, psalmist. We keep this psalm in the Bible and continue to benefit from it, even though it was written trying to make God look like the one that has dropped the ball, but it was actually God trying to get them away from that ruin that they brought themselves into. Yeah, and this is very reminiscent of Job, isn't it? Where you have chapter after chapter after chapter of theological nonsense. These are the standard things that people were saying in the ancient world about suffering, and none of them applied to Job. And the reader almost laughs reading the book of Job because you know the first two chapters. You know what the real context is. You know why Job is suffering. He doesn't know, and certainly his friends don't know, but they think they know. And they blather on and on and on about things the reader knows is nonsense. So if you ever tell anyone that your favorite text is in the book of Job, be very careful. <laughs> it might not be a text that God would approve, because God did say at the end, you know, your friends need repentance here. Pray for them, because uh, you said what was right, and they said what was wrong. So uh, at the end, God identifies chapters of the book as not being correct theology. So uh, the Psalms is part of this whole wisdom tradition, which surprises us in many ways with its teaching. All right, looking forward to your comment, Bob. Just a brief footnote. There is a whole area later when they are in captivity, when the prophet tells them to be good citizens of Babylon and not be so pessimistic, raise their families and all of that. And if this is related to that, then there was a message back from God to counteract their pessimism, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So God said, I can use this, and I didn't intervene because you needed it in some very extended way. After all, God had sent to Abraham, my mission for you is that all the Gentiles would be blessed. And to Israel, he says, you will be a priest to the nations, a kingdom of priests. So God's mission was for Babylon from the beginning. And he said, if you will truly serve me and, and obey me, you'll be a light to the nations. 
they will come to you. Well, Israel was never worth coming to, except maybe for a few years under Solomon's reign, when the Queen of Sheba came. God sends them to the nations, not willingly, but the Babylonians were simply helping them with their evangelism by scattering them around the ancient world. So the Bible is often a bit counterintuitive and requires a second look before we settle on the meaning of a passage. Arthur. I look at the last verses where the psalmist seems to tell God that if you deliver us, then we will praise you forever. I don't know whether I'm right to relate this also to the grieving process. There is Kubler-Ross who suggested that we go through several stages, and one of them is bargaining. You know, there's a sense in which we say, if you really deliver us, if you really do this to us, then we'll praise you. We feel like maybe that will move him to act because it's so threatening to accept the actual loss that we are perceiving. So maybe we think by bargaining with him that if he just delivers us, then definitely we're going to do A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like your reference to Kubler-Ross's work. She basically laid out that there are five stages of grieving whenever somebody is grieving. And they include things like the denial stage, the anger stage, the bargaining stage, you know, where you try to cut a deal with God, and then ending up with acceptance or resignation of the new situation. So I think that that's relevant that the psalmist would have some evidence of that. So that is all part of the possibilities there of Psalm 79. Well, when we realize that the temple represented the house of God, represented the very place where God was governing Israel. The destruction of the temple was a divine scandal. In the ancient world, it gave the nations an opportunity to mock the God of Israel. The claim of the Israelites was Yahweh is not just the God of Israel, he's the God of the whole earth. So the Israelites were not just settling on, well, okay, we have the gods of Babylon, the gods of Egypt, and the gods of Syria, and Yahweh is the God of Israel, and you know, you all got your territories. But no, ultimately the scriptures teach Yahweh is the God of the entire earth. But Yahweh seems way weaker than the gods of Egypt or Babylon, because those nations had power over. And when the Babylonians destroyed the temple, carried the vessels with them to Babylon, it was a message to the world, we have conquered Yahweh, not just Israel. So God was willing for his reputation to be completely destroyed in all of this. And that's an amazing thing. In the ancient world, gods were judged by their power, by their ability to deliver, the ability to rescue. And the Psalms of Lament recognize that God doesn't always do that, that God is powerful, all-powerful, as some of the Psalms said, but he exercises that power with mercy and with restraint. And a God who acts with restraint is very foreign in the ancient world, and I suspect very foreign in our world as well. So let's move ahead to number three in our handout. And let's take a look at Psalm 88. This is another type of lament. The laments we've been looking at so far are laments when your team loses, when your country gets devastated, when your temple gets destroyed. But there are other types of sorrow. And uh, Psalm 88 is one of those. Psalm 88, and uh, let's look at verses 3 through 12. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like those who have no help, like those forsaken among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions of the dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. 
You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a thing of horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call on you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the shades rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your saving help in the land of forgetfulness? So what stage of life is this psalm expressing? It seems clear, I think, to most scholars, this is talking about somebody who's got, as we say, one foot in the grave, someone who's aging, the capacities are declining, the person is depressed. And keep in mind, just as in those days they tended to localize God in temples and particular places, similarly in those days, there was not a hope of resurrection. They were not thinking in terms, they were saying, well, you live on in your children and your grandchildren, and so you have significance uh, beyond your life. But the idea of coming back bodily from the grave was not widespread at all in the ancient world. In fact, in the Old Testament, the clearest statements of resurrection are right at the very end, just in the last couple hundred years, like Daniel 12. So the conviction of resurrection of the body was relatively late in that period. And so the psalmist is fearing death as maybe a place that God can't reach. There's no expectation of release from the grave. So we have here images of despair, images of finality, etc. So this psalm talks about suffering as a fact of life for believers. The one who wrote this psalm was a believer in God, and yet they're seeing their body breaking down. They're seeing their position in life being undermined, and it seems like the prayers are going no higher than the ceiling. And it seems like maybe God's wonders, kindness, faithfulness, and righteousness are going away as well. So can God actually penetrate into the grave? In another psalm, it says he can penetrate into the womb. But the psalmist is wondering and worrying. And the interesting thing is, when we suffer like this, when we come to the end of life, there's a tendency sometimes to blame God or to blame ourselves. You know, well, I'm in this condition because I didn't eat right or whatever. Well, that may be true, but is that useful at that point to be placing blame? And yet it's so natural for human beings to do it. Have you ever blamed God for a situation that you are in? How would you read a Psalm like 88 today? I like to read Psalm 88 in the light of the cross. And while it may not be 100% clear in Scripture, in the book Desire of Ages, we are told that Jesus could not see beyond the portals of the tomb. That at the moment he was hanging on the cross, Jesus, like the psalmist, did not see the way out. And he ended up trusting God in the absence of a theological path toward that future. So we often read these Psalms in the light of the New Testament, but realizing even Jesus could have expressed it in this way, that at the moment he was on the cross, he did not see his way through in the end. Henry? It seems to me that based on verses 6 to 8, the psalmist is Blaming God, you have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me, like blaming God. But is it possible that when Michael was mentioning that these people of Israel at this time was monotheistic God, they did not have, they couldn't believe in the opposite, Satan on the other side, because that will make him an equal contender against God. So... It was the only natural thing for them to believe. It was coming from God because there was no other God. So is that just the perspective of them, not necessarily a description of reality, but the way that they understood a cultural thought of the moment? 
And you remember that we talked in the previous lesson about the tension between determinism and freedom, between the sovereignty of God and the freedom of human beings to decide. And perhaps the psalmist here is a bit more on the deterministic side, and that would be that God is behind us. Keep in mind that those Christians that border on determinism, you know, the super Calvinists, etc., they believe in God. They believe that he will win the great controversy, but still they attribute pretty much everything that happens to God. So that kind of deterministic approach is not uncommon among Christians. And I think Seventh-day Adventists who have so strongly emphasized the cosmic conflict as an answer to the issues of suffering are much more willing to blame Satan, much more willing to blame us for the sorry condition of the world than to blame God. But I think Henry is making a helpful suggestion that the psalmist may well have seen God as so deterministic that he is the source of evil as well as good. And when anything bad happens, God is behind it in some way. Henry, you want to follow up on that? Yes, thank you. The only option left is for the psalmist to acknowledge that it is the result of their own actions, of their own faults that was bringing all of this destruction around them. But again, that continues to be in tension with what they believe to be, the chosen people of God. So how can be the chosen people of God be so bad to be resulting on this? So this is a consistent tension that probably Christians, we continue to have today, right? We believe that we are the true church, so we cannot be the ones that need to live from out of Babylon. And we start blaming others instead of recognizing that the problem is us, nobody else. I cannot blame anybody else. I just need to look at me and see that everything is the result of my choices. And in early times, the, res the logic result of living in a world when everybody does whatever they want and they can create damage and pain and suffering for others just because they want. Thank you, Henry. Olivius. There's something positive, though, in this writing of the psalmist, and that is that he's still holding on to God. In verse 2, let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to my cry. Verse 9, every day I call upon you, O Lord, I spread out my hands to you. And then verse 13, but I, O Lord, cry to you in the morning, my prayer comes before you. So there's a contrast here of all these negatives, but the psalmist is still holding on. Yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that out. And we mentioned even the complaints and the curses of the psalms. The fact that they're able to express these things so poignantly is an indication of their trust in God. So that even as the psalmist blaming God, who's he talking to? He's not talking to his fellow psalmist. He's not talking to the spouse. He's not talking to the children, poisoning the well. No, these are spoken to God. All right, so these are the honest feelings of someone who knows God, someone who walks with God and is willing to share with God exactly where he is. And in that authenticity, God can apply a healing presence more effectively, perhaps, than elsewhere. God doesn't override our freedom. So God looks for us to be authentic about the situation because he can heal whatever we're real about. If you go to a physician and you hide some of the symptoms, the physician may make a wrong diagnosis. And that's not on the physician. That's on the patient, you see. And God is looking for us to be totally honest with the symptoms in our life. And that's what the Psalms are doing. So they are beautiful in their horror sometimes, but they are real. Michael. Yeah, reading this Psalm at my age versus when I was about 21 years of age, the perception is much different. The older I get, I know that the end of my life is closer, much closer than I, when I was 21 years of age. And I've also thought about this idea of predestination. I've considered that many times. And the problem with it, in my view, is it means there's no free will. And yeah, I committed these murders, but I, I was predestined to do these things. I never had any choice in the matter. And that's a cop-out. Every difficult circumstance in my life, and I don't care what it is, if I'm complaining about 
my wife, the kids, and the deaths, and so forth. And I have to ask myself, who brought those things into my life? They weren't forced upon me. And so ultimately, I have responsibility to manage my life in the best way I know how. All right. Thank you, Michael. Innocent suffering is a fact of life. So sometimes we've caused our suffering, but sometimes we haven't. Those who happen to live next to a sludge pond from the people who invented Teflon became very, very sick. Their lives were destroyed. And that story is now being researched and coming out. Are they to blame for their suffering? Is God to blame? The answer is an emphatic no in both cases. Yet suffering is part of life. It's part of a world that is tainted by sin. So the story of Job is who's at fault here, Job or God? And Job ultimately says, well, neither one. You know, This is the circumstance of life. Let's look at another suffering psalm, Psalm 102 and verses 1 to 7. First seven verses. And, you know, it'd be good to read all of these Psalms, but that would take a lot of time and would probably be difficult to just keep it all in our minds. So let's read just the first seven verses of Psalm 102. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me on the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily on the day when I call. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is stricken and withered like grass. I am too wasted to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my skin. I am like an owl of the wilderness, like a little owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I am like a lonely bird on the housetop. So what kind of suffering are we seeing here? This is the suffering of loneliness. The psalmist feels abandoned by God, feels separated from God. So what does the psalmist do? When the psalmist feels abandoned, feels alone, and probably all of us can relate to moments, hours, days, maybe weeks, where we've felt the same way. What does the psalmist do? God is silent. What does the psalmist do? Refuse to be silent when God is silent. The psalmist knows that God will not be silent forever. It may feel that way at the moment, but God will not be silent forever. And so the psalmist says, I'm going to keep talking. God may seem to have abandoned me, but I'm not going to abandon God. There's no future if I abandon God. And so the psalmist tells God, about the loneliness, like a bird on the rooftop or an owl out in the desert, all alone, lonely, and yet God can still be spoken to. Let's go to number five, Psalm 77. It says, what experience is the author going through and what resolution happens by the end of the psalm? I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, that he may hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. I think of God and I moan. I meditate and my spirit faints. You keep my eyelids from closing. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old and remember the years of long ago. I commune with my heart in the night. I meditate and search my spirit. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love ceased forever? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? And I say, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? 
You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the peoples. With your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. The very deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies thundered. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. All right, so the psalmist here is struggling. And prayer just doesn't seem to be helping. At first, even remembering God seems to intensify his anguish. It says he's moaning, and the Hebrew word for moaning there at the beginning of this psalm is also the sound of a cataract, raging waters. It's not a quiet moaning. It's an intense sense of unrest. In verse 4, he's too depressed to talk. He can't sleep. He reviews the past, and what comes to him is that, well, God was merciful back then but his mercy seems to have ceased. He has abandoned me. So taking a look at the psalm, what solution do you think the psalmist finds? How does he deal with this sense of abandonment, this aloneness, this deep, depressed sadness? What does the psalmist grasp as a solution? I'm thinking particularly the last five to ten verses. Rita. He calls to mind the good times when he knows that God was with him, with his people. And that tells him that a bad time won't go on forever. Very often in management of depression, we're asked to remember a time, you know, no matter how fleeting, when you didn't feel like you did now so that you know that you can get back to that position. Thank you. And Nancy? I just wanted to say what Rita said, that he went over the evidence of the past. He remembered. And it reminds me how important remembering is to God. Like, remember the Sabbath day. Remember Egypt, he says in Deuteronomy, for this fourth commandment. Remember, remember. That's our safety. I think, too, through the time of trouble. We have to remember the evidence, even though we feel terrible and nothing looks good. And isn't that what Jesus did on the cross? He remembered evidence of God is there. He's loving, even though he had no idea where he was. And what interests me about this psalm is that is a solution that is offered frequently in the psalms, that recite what God has done before, recount God's mighty acts in the past, But early in this psalm, the very remembering seems to make it worse, because, well, God did all that then. What about now? You see? But there's something about, in fact, the essence of Old Testament worship was talking about what God has done, recounting the mighty acts of God. And in repeating them over and over again, the power of the original act, the power of the resurrection, the power of the exodus, the power of creation is brought into the immediate situation. Doesn't happen every time. It didn't happen for this psalmist right away. But one of the ways in which God's people in ancient times coped with the challenges that they face with these lamenting times was to recount what God had done for them in the past. There's a chapter in the book Ministry of Healing called Mind Cure. And there Ellen White offers a solution to depression. Because when darkness seems to fill your life, look to the place where you last saw the light. So the psalmist could recount what God had done for Israel coming out of Egypt, or could recount creation and all the wonderful gifts that God gave human beings. But sometimes the psalmist would look to the place where they last saw the light. Sometimes the psalmist would say, well, in the past, you did this for me and that for me and the other thing for me. So it can happen either way. In Ministry of Healing, the idea is that you go back to the moment when you last were really tight with God, when you last sensed his presence, review 
that time. And that's one reason why many suggest the spiritual journal. And I like to call it the book of providence. When you have a remarkable experience with God, write it down because people tend to forget. And when you write that down, that can be your sustenance later on when things get dark. I've sometimes said the best devotional book you'll ever read is the one you write yourself. That when you're reading what God has done for you in the past, reminding yourself of those actions, that can have a tremendous positive effect in the present. So one of the ways in which the Psalms encourage us to face these difficult times is by remembering what God has done in your past and in the past of God's people. Henry. Sometimes I think that we have so much of a need of a display of power in order to be sure of what type of God he is. And it makes me feel that we only consider that he loves us if he has done great things in the past. Mm. But it would be good for us to come into the position of, regardless if we have or not have any mighty or any good outcomes in the past, that we can continue to trust God because of who he is or not because of what he has done. Because it's not the power, the display of power or the great miracles that he has done, the ones that demonstrate exactly the type of person he is. He can be next to us, suffering, but not letting us go. And that will be more than enough for me at this point in life. And this is what I think Jesus was trying to show, or he actually demonstrated in the cross. He felt no closeness of his father. And regardless of what he was seeing or he was feeling or experiencing, he said, but still I trust you. And I lay my spirit in your hands, even though I cannot feel you or see you close to me. I will say that these Psalms, yes, are a great reminder of what God has done, but it will be good for us to start learning on the, not relying on that power, but just on the type of person he is. Even if I don't see him anymore, in eternity, I will continue to trust him. I really like, Henry, what you said there toward the beginning of your comments. You said, come to the place. We can come to the place where even if we don't have something to point back to, we can trust God. And I think that expresses an important dynamic we haven't talked about, and that is spiritual maturity. You remember the stages of faith. At different levels of faith, people relate to God differently, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But the goal is spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity comes to the place where one trusts God in spite of the evidence, trusts God even when you can't remember the past and the place where you last saw the light. But that's a stage that many or most of us have not reached. And recognizing, I think the psalmists are coming out of different stages of faith. And that's important to keep in mind. If we think of the psalmists all as spiritual superheroes, we may be missing some of the dynamic here, that the psalmists are coming from different places in the life of faith. And when you're at that particular place, that particular psalm may be particularly important to you. But as we grow in faith, sometimes other psalmists may have a message that is more powerful for us. Arthur? I really sometimes struggle when maybe I consider how I perceive God to have been very active. For example, in the early church, if you look at the book of Acts, where there is a lot of activity happening that confirms the presence of God, I also find a similar pattern happening with the early days of Adventism. I feel like there was a hive of activity, whether with what was happening to Ellen White, prayer meetings, healings, and all those things. Then for some reason, when I compare it to now, I feel there's less of it. The reason I'm raising it is when we say maybe over time we become mature, are we implying that over time it doesn't matter whether we hear from God directly or where it really doesn't matter, maybe we've come to a point where we know whether there's a voice or there's no voice, God is still there. And I'm trying to relate that to the history of the church as well as the history of the Adventist church to say, can we say this lack of activity 
is because we've matured, we've come to this level of understanding that it doesn't matter whether there is activity or there is silence. Oh, Arthur, you put a whole new dimension into this, and that's fascinating. I don't know that I, I want to even try to speak to that at the moment, but what I hear you suggesting is, can a church reach a level of maturity where it does not need so many overt activities? I think that's a very fruitful direction for thought and consideration. I hope you'll continue probing those ideas and, and seeing if you can find examples in the scripture. So thank you for sharing that intriguing thought. Let's go to number six, and this is one of the most famous of all the Psalms, Psalm 73, and it's similar in many ways to others that we have looked at in this lesson, but the solution is different than what has been expressed in the earlier Psalms, verse 1 to verse 28. And let's immerse ourselves in this Psalm and ask yourself the question, what is the psalmist's solution? This time, it's not remembering the, the acts of God in the past. Instead, it seems more of a looking to the future or looking above. So think about that. What is the psalmist offering as a solution to one of these dark experiences? Truly, God is good to the upright, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pain. Their bodies are sound and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not plagued like other people. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes swell out with fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven, and their tongues range over the earth. Therefore the people turn and praise them, and find no fault in them. And they say, How can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Such are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain I have kept my heart clean, and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and am punished every morning. If I had said, I will talk on in this way, I would have been untrue to the circle of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment swept away utterly by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. On awakening, you despise their phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was stupid and ignorant. I was like a brute beast towards you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will receive me with honor. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire other than you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Indeed, those who are far from you will perish. You will put an end to those who are false to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge to tell of all your works. So you could call this a psalm of envy. As the psalmist looks around, he sees that the promises of Proverbs are just not working. You know, the righteous will prosper. The wicked will come to ruin. And he looks around and he says, that's nonsense. That's not reality as I'm seeing it. The worst people I know seem to have the fewest problems. They don't seem to suffer at all. They're proud. They're violent. They're scoffers. And yet other people approve of them. They mock God and increase in riches anyway. My obedience seems to have been in vain. All right, so the psalmist here is decrying the fact that in his world, none of these promises in the Proverbs and in some of the Psalms come true. Everything is messed up. Everything's gone backwards. Yet the psalm ends on a positive note. 
What's the difference? What is it that the psalmist sees as a way out? He doesn't seem to do it in Psalm 77, which may have been the same person, by the way. But he doesn't do there, you know, recount the mighty acts of God. What is his solution here? And how can we make it practical for today? Livius, give it a try. While we were reading Psalm 77, I have a reference in 7713 where it says, Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? And it references Psalm 73, verse 17, which reads, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. What I get from these two Psalms is that it's about character. God's holiness is his character. So when it says, your way, O God, is holy, what it's really saying, what God has a great character like our God? And in Psalm 73, notice that he says in verse 13, I kept my heart clean. So I think it's about the sanctuary of God exists behind our forehead, behind our eyes, and that's where God wants to dwell. And it's about having a right character. I think absolutely from a New Testament perspective, we need to see temple language as referring very much to our own inner walk. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit, therefore eat and drink to the glory of God, etc. But it seemed to me that the psalmist here is referring either to the temple building of Israel or it is referring to the heavenly sanctuary. And there's a couple of places in the Old Testament where it seems to go beyond the temple to a temple in heaven. How does that turn him around spiritually? What is there about the sanctuary? And, and Livius has suggested that the character of God is a piece of it. But he says, when I look to the sanctuary, what did he see? Henry? It seems to me that the sanctuary is a depiction of the whole plan of salvation. So he is looking at the end of all of the conflict. So it seems to be like in vain we do all of these things that happen today, but there is a glimpse of hope, something that is not yet. And we see that again, that idea in the verses 24. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will take me into glory. And he says, whom have I in heaven but you? So even though everything could be wrong in this mad world that we are living in, this is not the end. There is something much better that we are hoping to, and this is what the sanctuary was showing to him, that there is a path and not all things are even in this side of eternity, but there is hope for an even world to come. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Henry. I like your emphasis here that the sanctuary is the place where you see the big picture. I think that was a really important insight that the psalmist, when he looks at the sanctuary, he's looking at the whole plan of salvation and that this will make a difference. What about you, Arthur? What do you think? Could it be possible that the psalmist is also saying, was envious of all these evil people until I realized? that I have access to God, and God is physically present in this sanctuary, which those evil people are not having access to. So while I feel like they are having it well, and they are enjoying pleasures, and it looks like everything is going well for them, but here am I, I have God, I have him within access. So until I realize that God is near, and accessible to me. That's when I stopped worrying. All right. Thank you, Rita. The beginning of Psalm 73, the psalmist says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And he says, I almost slipped. I envied the arrogant when I saw their prosperity. And then he describes the things that he'd seen and, and envied. But then he went into the sanctuary of God the sanctuary is a safe place, and as has already been said, this is where God was, and it brought him back to the goodness of God to Israel and what that goodness meant, and it wasn't that which he had envied. Thank you. Livius? 
is the psalmist contrasting the God that Israel worships compared to the gods of others and the results of worshiping Baal and all the other gods, just contrasting the gods of worship? Yeah. As we draw to a conclusion, let me suggest that what Psalm 73 is getting at is a sense of perspective. When you are in a room, your horizon is very limited. It's the four walls that are around you. But when you step outside, your horizon expands. And more than that, when you climb a mountain, your horizon expands exponentially. So where you stand and what you are looking at makes a difference. The psalmist begins with a statement of faith and then immediately says, but I almost slipped because I was looking at the people around me. I was looking at the environment and I was seeing this, 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 and this that didn't fit. And I was beginning to lose hope and beginning to lose faith. So the message of Psalm 73 is not look to the place where you last saw the light. It's not recount the mighty acts of God in the past. Both of those are very, very important options to keep in mind. But in this case, the psalmist said what I needed to do was get up on a high place. I needed to see a bigger picture. I needed to look at the sanctuary. I needed to see the end of all things. That one day we will come to the end of our lives or the end of this world. And when we look back, everything will fall into place. We will see with clear perspective when we have the whole picture. One of the problems of faith is that we often don't have the whole picture. We're just looking at what's around us. We're seeing what people are saying on the internet. We're seeing what's happening in our society. We're living in a strange land. And when we focus on the strange land, our thinking becomes strange as well. And so to see the bigger picture that we see in the sanctuary, that we see in the cosmic conflict, this is one of the ways in which psalmists were able to make it through the times of lament and the times of depression. With that in mind, let's pray. Lord, I Thank you once again for these psalms. These were some of the most uncomfortable psalms we could possibly read. And in many ways, we like to act as if this was not an expression of faith, but rather an expression of doubt. And yet you've placed them in your word and juxtaposed them with other types of psalms and realize that you're helping us to see realities that we also experience. At five o'clock in the morning or in the darkest hours, we sometimes almost slip, as Asaph once said. And I pray, Lord, that we would grow with you day by day and that these darker experiences will prove to be the greatest education of all. Pray that you would be with us throughout those times. And when possible, may we truly sense your presence. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.